Well, welcome again to North Shore. It is just really good to see everybody who's gathered in this space and all of you who may be joining us online. We're glad you're with us as well. Uh, I just will ask for a little grace at the beginning here. I've been a little under the weather this week, so my voice is not what it normally is. So hang in there with me as we walk through this. But um, just want to start again with a quick reminder about something that starts next week. So I got one week more to prepare, but you've been hearing about it. We've been sharing about it. Uh, it's next Monday night. Well, actually, it's Sunday night, but Monday morning at 12.01 a.m., we're kicking off a week of continuous prayer. Uh, we're actually doing that with 52 other churches and ministries from all over the country who are each taking a week during the year. Why? Because we believe that God is moved to action when we pray. Um, it's not just superstition. It's not just something that we do just, you know, because we're about to have a meal, we want to bless it kind of thing. We believe God's moved to action. In fact, there's a great line, some of you know this, in the book of Chronicles in the Old Testament where uh, the writer says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then it says, God will hear from heaven and forgive our sin and heal our land. By the way, does anyone else think our land needs some healing these days? And so we're gonna approach this humbly, we're gonna approach this with a lot of openness, uh, it doesn't mean that we should stop with our prayers, but we should at least start with prayer. And so I'm asking everybody who calls North Shore home, that's everybody here, if you've been here and you call this place home, to sign up for an hour to pray. We're gonna have a dedicated space on campus 24-7. There'll be guidance for you, and anybody can do this. If you don't feel like you're super spiritual, you know how to pray, come and spend an hour and see what God does in that hour. Um, you can go on online at northshore.church, scroll down, there's a little tab that says Unbroken Prayer, click on that and register for an hour. I picked an hour really early in the morning because while God loves everybody, we know he prefers morning people, so we, <laughs> that's the one I picked. Uh, and just so you know, all those late night slots that we don't take, Wolfgang has to cover all of them, so it's gonna be a hard week for Wolfgang. So can we all jump in and do this together? Are you willing? Yep. I won't, I'll, I will say this. It will be the most important thing we do as a church this year. Okay, let me pray. Jesus, uh, we begin right now by asking you just to speak into our hearts and into our lives and uh, begin to disrupt those parts of our lives right now that need a little disruption. Uh, begin to encourage those parts of our hearts that need a little encouragement. And let us hear from you, not from me or from our neighbor or from our past or any voices in our head, but from you over these next few moments, the words you would have just for each of us so we can be your people and follow you in faith. And we pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So I have a dear friend who took uh, his three young children to a place that's known as the happiest place on earth. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Disney, right? Uh, and they were so excited. They'd planned this trip, and they were planning ahead. They had all their gear. They are ready to go and just dreaming about Space Mountain and pictures with Mickey and all the overpriced high-calorie food. And it was just, they, he was expecting, like, nonstop smiles all day. You're already laughing because you know where this is going. And so they got there. And it was an August day, it was about 115 degrees. They had to stand in line for hours upon hours. His kids wouldn't stop crying and hitting and screaming. Everyone was miserable. And so by the end of the first day, my friend just lost it. And he told his kids, do you know how much your mom and dad paid for you to be here? Which of course they don't. So he said, you're gonna stop crying, wait in line, get on this ride and be happy. Or I'm gonna give you something to be happy about. <laughs> so much for the happiest place on earth, right? Question, have you ever noticed how obsessed we all are with the pursuit of happiness in our lives? I mean, you think about it, happiness or the desire for it, it drives so many, if not all of our decisions. It drives how we approach our relationships. It has so much to do with our, our pursuit of things like reputation or power or status or success. It's not just we want those things, it's that we think those things will make us Happy, right? And we don't just want happiness for ourselves, we want it for those we love. Think about when a parent has, a, or when parents have children, one of the comments that we so often make is, I just want them to be happy. 
I remember the days leading up to the birth of our first child, Nora, and all the different hopes I had for her. I hope she's healthy. I hope she makes good friends. I hope she meets the man of her dreams when she's 30 or 40 years old, somewhere way down the way. Human beings long for happiness, and we long for the people we care about to experience happiness. The problem is happiness, by definition, it's kind of rooted in the word itself, is this deeply circumstantial emotion. In fact, it depends on, literally, on what happens to you, right? Which means happiness is surprisingly elusive, it's hard to find, and once you've found it, and you think you've got it, you take a breath, and guess what? It's gone. And where did it go? And how do I get it back? And so we get back on the wheel trying to find our way back to happiness. It's this kind of circumstantial thing. I was reading about it this week. There's a lot of research on happiness and what psychologists call subjective well-being. And there's this one set of research that's, defound, that's found what they call the happiness you. You might heard the happiness you. I'd never heard of this before. This idea that happiness from your 20s actually declines down in and through your 40s, but then in your 50s, 60s, and 70s will go kind of back up, creates this kind of you of happiness. And this pattern is found across you know, nations and cultures. It's actually a very common pattern, this happiness you. By the, uh, by the way, any guesses on what the unhappiest age in life, according to the research, was? 48 and four months. Any guesses on how old I am? I am 48 and four months this month. So if I come across a little grumpy in this message, I got to tell you, it's because statistically speaking, this is the unhappiest moment of my life. Like right now, like you're, you picked the worst day to come to church. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm up here. It's unhappy. So here's my point. Unhappiness is this fleeting thing. Whether you, whatever part of the U curve you're on or whether your curve looks more like a Z or a whatever letter it looks like, it changes just like that. I have an aunt who was healthy and thriving who started having some headaches, went to the doctor, and then was told she has terminal brain cancer. There's a woman in our church who's happy and thriving, whose hus husband came home one day and said, I don't want to be married anymore, left her with three kids. And sometimes, sometimes, it's not just bad circumstances that kind of rob our happiness, it's actually the good ones. Get this, I have a friend who, has, who got the job of his dreams, made a lot of money, built a name for himself, all of his career aspirations came true, but it didn't bring him more happiness. In fact, he'd tell you, he's emptier and lonelier than he's ever been. All that's to say, I wonder, I wonder, so thought experiment, just work with me on this for a moment. I wonder if there's something even more important in our lives than chasing happiness. Now, I'm not saying the goal should be unhappiness or misery, but what if there's something more important than just trying to be happy? I once heard someone put it this way, the key question in life isn't, are you happy? The key question is, are you free? Are you free? Free from the bondage of things like regret or guilt or shame or insecurity or fear or the need for approval or bitterness or envy. Free to experience uh, things like love and joy and peace and purpose. Even, even when bad things are happening to you and your happiness isn't what it should be. Are you free? For these last few weeks, we've been in this series in this letter in the New Testament called Galatians, and the, uh, the series called Breakthrough. And we've been talking about how the grace of Jesus breaks into our lives. That's the good news at the heart of all this we do, that grace has broken into our lives uh, and gives us a chance to be free. And then we talked about how it breaks down the barriers that are between us and how it can give us a new identity as adopted sons and daughters of God. And by the way, if you missed either Stan or Wolfgang over the past two Sundays preach, you miss these guys just bringing. It was just amazing. You gotta go back and listen. It was incredible. Yes, absolutely. But today, we're gonna dive into what the Apostle Paul said about this good news and what it has to do with this idea of freedom and growing in freedom and why that's even better for you than happiness. Don't believe me? All right, let's open our, word, open our Bibles if you have one or a Bible app on your phone. I'll have it here on the screen as well. Galatians chapter four, verse eight. Paul writes these words. It's right where we left off last week. Formerly, 
He says, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those, those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? You see, Paul here is not just talking about believing the wrong things or having the wrong ideas. He's talking about forces in our lives that literally enslave us. So keep that thought as we keep going. Jumping down to verse 21, verse 21, he says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. And then Paul qualifies all this, if you're kind of confused, saying these things are meant to be taken figuratively. The, woman represents two, the women represent two different covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. And skipping down to verse 28, Paul says, now you, brothers and sisters, are like the other son, like Isaac, children of a promise. At, the at that time, the son born according, to the, born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, or Hagar's son, persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. And it's the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman or of the free woman. And then Paul brings all this home, if you're really confused, saying, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So if you're feeling a little lost, a little confused, Long Old Testament illustration in there. We're gonna unpack some of that in a moment. But what I wanna do as we walk through this is just walk through three simple questions to help us understand what these words have to do with our lives today. First question will be this. What is Paul saying we are freed for? Sorry, freed from. What is Paul saying we are freed from? Like from what? And then second, what is Paul saying we are freed for? And then third, how can we find that freedom in our lives? So what are we freed from? What are we freed for? And how can we find that freedom in our lives today? So here we go, first question. What are we freed from? Now depending on your faith background or church background, whether you have it or not, you'll have different words or ideas that may come into your mind as you think about this question. For me, I grew up with a real, the answer I grew up with is a real simple word from the Bible, just this word sin. How many of you have heard of the word sin? Just raise your hand for a second, okay? Now, how many of you feel like the word sin is just kind of associated with like doing kind of bad things? Raise your hand if that's what you get. Yeah, doing bad things, yeah. How many, how many, how many, how many of you think uh, uh, the person next to you have more sin than you do? No, don't raise your hand, don't. Yeah. I saw several hands go up. A lot of couples need some stuff going on with that one, so. Anyway, most people think of sin as just doing the wrong thing. And if that's all it is, what do we do? We tend to just justify ourselves by finding somebody out there who's done more wrong things than us so we don't have to feel so bad about ourselves. But notice, Paul didn't use the word sin in this passage, not because he doesn't care about sin, but because he's defining it a little differently. Look back again at Paul's words in verse eight. He doesn't say, formerly when you did not know God, you were sinners, though that was true. He says, formerly when you did not know God, you were what? Slaves. Slaves to what? to those who by nature are not gods. In other words, before you knew Christ, before you put your faith in him, before grace was in your life, you were slaves to idols. Not just doing some bad things or getting the wrong stuff on your resume, you were actually being controlled by forces beyond what you can control. And just so you know, idols aren't like strange little statues. Idols are anything that we treat or rely on as gods in our life including lots of the good things that he's made for us in this world, things like success or money or pleasure, to name a few. And Paul is saying, when these good things are treated as gods, even though they're not gods, when we rely on them for our security, our identity, our worth, we're not just in sin, we are enslaved. Because you see, once you've replaced your identity or your security or your worth that God gives you with something else, that idol, here's the, here's the really important point, that idol will drive your life like alcohol drives the life of an alcoholic. It runs that deep. And this is so, it's so, so important. 
Because I think a lot of us have a conception, especially if you have a church background like I do, a conception of sin as the wrong things I've done and Jesus died for them and I get a clean slate and I'll keep trying to figure out how to do the right things. And it's not wrong to want to do the right things, but you're missing the deeper battle, which is against the forces that have enslaved you to that idol. For example, let me just pick on my job. Let's pick on me for a second, not you. My job as a pastor. Let's say my job has become an idol in my life meaning the worth that I should find in God, my identity, my sense of security that I should find solely in him, I'm now attaching it to my success as a pastor or the fruitfulness of this church. May not sound like a big deal, but if my job's an idol, guess what? I'm no longer free to listen to God because I gotta be successful no matter what. If my job's an idol, I'm no longer free to love this congregation because you have to help make me successful in what I do. If my job was an idol, I'm no longer free to love my wife and family. They have to keep supporting my ministry no matter what what needs to happen. See, even if I avoid major sins, I'm not actually free if I'm enslaved to this idol of success in my life. And like any addiction with an idol in life, you cannot beat it on your own. And this is what so many of us misunderstand. Because yeah, I can get up one day and make a different decision. But I don't have the power. Paul's saying, I don't, I, I, we don't have the power to overcome the idols and the control they have over our lives. But here's the good news. Paul is reminding these churches in Galatia, the grace of Jesus doesn't merely wipe out our resumes of wrongdoing. It actually breaks the bondage of those idols, those other gods, just like a breaking an addiction. Which means, which means through grace you can break free of bitterness or past hurts or anger or envy or lust or other people's approval. I know people in churches, because I've been one of them, who spend their lives trying to do all the right things because their idol is the approval of other people. And so they'll even put on a mask and pretend to be someone they're not to make sure other people think they're doing a good job. That's not freedom, friends. That's slavery. And there are idols, by the way, like this all over churches today. The grace of Jesus can set you free from the idols that are driving your life. And I wonder, I wonder right now, maybe what's come to mind for you or a part of your life or a struggle you have or a habit that you realize, wait a minute, I'm dealing with something way stronger than just me. And no matter how many promises I've made or attempts to kind of well up the strength on my own, I haven't been able to beat it. Or maybe you just find yourself swapping one idol for the next. So I got rid of that one only to get this one. Jesus and his grace has the power to break you, to set you free from the power of those idols that have formerly enslaved you. By the way, next week we're gonna celebrate baptisms on Sunday. Baptism is a public expression of a personal decision to say yes to Jesus, why? So you can be set free, right? It is not just some sort of a superstitious thing. And if you've never said yes to Jesus or taken the step to be baptized, take out that connection card and let us know and sign up and take this step so that you can experience freedom in your life. You don't have to be stuck anymore. Grace can set you free from idols. Second question we're gonna ask. If we're freed from being slaves to idols, what then, question two, are we freed for? This is kind of the so what part of the message. Like, so what do I get to do next? And this one should be a little more obvious because Paul actually wrote it real plainly. We heard at the end of the scripture we read. Paul said, it is for what? Freedom that Christ has set us free which sounds really good. Like that's one of those verses like you wanna put up on the wall. Like I love that one, that sounds good. I want more of that. The problem is that word freedom in our day is synonymous with you get to do whatever you want, right? I mean, in our world, if we think of freedom, it's just you get to do whatever you want. That's what being free to us means. But here's the problem. That's not actually freedom at all because God made the world and he made human beings to be a certain way and to live a certain way. And the more we learn how to live that way, the more free we are to be who God made us to be. Now, I can tell looking at your faces, a little confused by that, so let me try to illustrate this for you to make some sense of it, okay? Our daughter, Nora, is learning to play the piano. She's learning, she's had three lessons, so we're real early on in the process, right? But she's learned enough to know what the different notes are and how some of the scales work, 
even how to play some simple little songs like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which when I listen to it, sounds like Beethoven to me. Like, I'd sound, it's amazing. Jude, who's our almost four-year-old, he's not had any lessons, doesn't understand any of the notes or the sounds, and when he plays the piano, it is a dark sound, okay? <laughs> it's like weeping and gnashing of teeth, okay? Like, it's not good. Here's my point. Jude can do, he's free to play whatever he wants, or he can do whatever he wants on the piano, but he's actually less free to play the piano as it was designed to play. Nora is learning the scales, the notes, the chords. It's a challenge. She's working at it, but every week, get this, she's a little more free to play the piano. And the proof, guess what? The proof is in what? It's in the music. It's in the music. And this is the kind of freedom Paul's talking about. It's not so you can go out and do whatever you want. It's so that you can know how to do life like Beethoven could play the piano. And the proof, guess what, will be in the music that your life makes. In fact, one of the best ways that you can assess your spiritual health, health isn't to ask, am I free or how free do I feel? A better question is, what kind of music is my life making? What kind of music is my life making? What kind of sounds and notes and melodies are coming out of my life? And by the way, that can be a hard question to ask if you look at it seriously. I was just looking back at my, I was just thinking this week about my life and some of the music my life makes and it got me thinking about how much impatient notes and impatient melodies come out of my life all the time, especially with my kids. I mean, how quick I can be to get angry or raise my voice when they don't listen to me for the 30th or 40th time, which is what happens, right? See, it doesn't matter how free I say I am. What matters is the kind of music that's coming out of my life. And the good news is the grace of Jesus doesn't just free us from impatience. It helps us learn to play a different kind of music in our lives. In fact, that's what the teaching of Jesus is all about in the Bible. He doesn't just give us more rules so we can go about trying to prove that we're good enough. That's just more bondage. It's why none of you want to do it. His teaching is the notes and the scales and the sheet music for living the way God made you to live, whether it's about forgiveness or generosity or just learning to be more patient with a three-year-old. By the way, this is what that strange illustration about the sons of Sarah and Hagar was all about. Paul uses uh, those sons, Ishmael and Isaac, to contrast being enslaved by the flesh that means I'm stuck trying to figure out how to bang on this piano, no idea how to do it, no idea how to play it, or set free by the promise of God who can free you to learn how to play the music he's designed you to play. Because what's even better than happiness is having the freedom to walk through life and enjoy the sounds my life is making. Wouldn't that be a good thing? I gotta say, when I think about my family life and my work life and my thought life and my financial life, I got a lot of aspirations and hopes and I got a lot of idols that still tie itself, but deep down, what I really long for is to make a better kind of music. Different than just every other song, bad song we sing playing out in the world versus the kind of music that God wants to play through our lives. And by the way, when we come to that text around the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, those are just the notes that come out of a life that's set free. A life that's set free. Which leads to the third and final question, and with this we're gonna wrap up today. How can we find this freedom in our lives? You wanna be free, you wanna be set free from idols, how do you find it? First, Paul says, stand firm. I love this. Stand firm in what? In grace. He says, be on the lookout for anything that even sniffs of the yoke of slavery in your life. And one of the exercises we need to do in our spiritual lives is actually begin to look for those places where we're still in bondage to an idol. It could even be a very spiritual looking idol. We're still in bondage to works of the flesh, works of the law, trying to prove ourselves by rules and performance and behavior. We gotta be on the lookout. That actually runs counter to all the freedom that God wants to give you in your life. And by the way, standing firm in grace isn't a solo sport. You need people around you who can help you turn from help you turn back from those old idols and other forms of bondage, even the religious looking ones. And some of you need to take that next step today. Stand firm in grace and then, and, then, and even more importantly, lean on the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a little subtle moment in the text when Paul was writing about Isaac as the child of promise and he describes him not as being born according to the flesh, but by the power of the Spirit. 
See, the promise that God gives us, the promise he has for you that we could learn to live life a new way, that you could be a new person in your life starting today, actually comes through the power of the Spirit, not your power, not your strength, his power, his Spirit. That's how you actually grow in freedom because I'm gonna be real straight with you right now. Can we be like honest with each other? And this is for me too. You cannot stop lusting or gossiping or judging or lying or pretending or whatever word goes in that blank for you on your own. You cannot do it. We are not just in sin, we are addicted to it, enslaved to it. But the power of the Holy Spirit can make you free, friends. The power of the Holy Spirit can make you free. And I wonder right now what some of you are so desperate for a little freedom in your life, what that would look like. Grace gives us freedom to come out of hiding. Grace gives us freedom to ask for help. Grace gives us the freedom to admit we can't do it on our own, but as any addict will tell you, it's admitting that you can't do it that what? Breaks the cycle of addiction for good. And that can be your step right now today. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take some time to pause and just listen for the Spirit to speak to us. And if that sounds like new or strange or spiritual language, all that means is pause, open your heart, how, however you know God in this moment, ask God to speak to you because Jesus is real, he'll speak to you and begin to convict you and speak to you about a part of your life where, you're, where he, he can give you freedom. So we have some scripture on the screens. Take a moment before we sing this next song and celebrate what Jesus has done for us on the cross to listen to his convicting spirit, his encouraging spirit speak about where we need to find freedom and then I'll come up and we'll pray.